really excited to welcome back a very special guest who's visited us, visited us once before in our studio. Robert Soha is a journalist with Teva Win. He covers like really big stories. He has uh, his work is featured uh, regularly on national television. Teva Win various investigative pieces on a number of interesting subjects. Uh, Robert, welcome back to the Crackcast. Your second appearance. Hello, everyone. It's my pleasure. All right. We uh, all five of us in the studio here today. We are practicing social distancing. Got our masks on. And uh, Dave, are you? Uh, are all you, good. Ready to rock and roll. Okay, we're all set. All right, Robert, let me ask uh, a general question about the Polish media first before we dive into some more specific subjects. Let me ask you about something that we, we discussed here on our show probably two months ago at the beginning of the coronavirus situation. We said that, uh, and I'm going to try to choose my words carefully here. We said that there seemed to be, in the Polish media, there seemed to be almost a competition to be the first media outlet or platform to kind of break the story, the, the first case, the first hospitalization, the first death, really. And, you know, obviously, I'm not suggesting that anybody in the media was happy about the coronavirus. But at the same time, this created, you know, something that, you know, the, the, the whole public wanted to know about, wanted to learn about the media. That's their job is, to, of course, to inform the public. Uh, is it fair to say that uh, the, 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 the Polish media has some kind of kind of a responsibility to cover the story that it's not always uh, fair in the sense that I'm kind of rambling here. Is it sometimes sensationalist or too sensationalist rather than straight news coverage of the coronavirus? I wouldn't generalize so much. Uh, we are quite different and there are different uh, media outlets here in Poland. But I believe that my uh, company TVN was pretty honest with the with the viewers, with the users. But I could see as well so much like this kind of rush you mentioned it, to be the first to deliver this piece of news that we already have coronavirus in Poland. And honestly, I even got into this trap one morning when I was. Uh, browsing my Facebook um, feed, and I saw this uh, this title, Coronavirus in Poland. So I basically clicked on it, and I got transferred uh, to the website of uh, a new Polish website. I wouldn't mention its name, but there I realized that those are only like assumptions, Nobody um, says that it's true and things like that. So basically, it was about clickbait. But I wouldn't say that it's only our Polish kind of problem because it's sure. a it's a global issue, and I would see it on this on this uh, perspective of ad supported business model and subscriptions. Because as long as we are chasing clicks, as long as we are chasing page views. And uh, as long as we are chasing digital uh, ads, we would be going into this kind of like uh, rabbit holes. But th that's the question, what we are looking for as, as users or, or, or viewers. And uh, it's basically good to, uh, to learn not to click on this kind of trash so you know I, you mentioned so you mentioned clickbait you mentioned page views and yeah in the social media world that we live in sensationalism gets attention it gets eyeballs and at the end of the day that is what the media whether it's a huge channel like tev or a smaller channel smaller magazines uh, newspapers whatever that's what they need traffic right that's the that's the name of the game and it seems to me and i'm not pointing fingers at any particular media outlet but it seems to me looking at all the headlines it seems to me that we're all going to die is going to get a lot more clicks than we're probably not going to die. And that kind of seems to drive the kind of coverage that we see. But that's, I think that's, that's a fundamental issue, what we are looking for and what's important from strategic, strategic, strategic point of view. Because I'm a subscriber to a few media outlets. Maybe I'm not a, I'm not a, I'm not a regular uh, like reader because I'm a journalist so it's kind of part of my work to read a lot and to consume media on a regular basis but I pay for news I pay for high quality information to get it uh, like well crafted uh, proofread and things like that 
And I believe in the news I get that it's true that it was deliver delivered by professional journalists. It was deeply researched. I don't click on news because I'm trying to be part of this uh, ad chasing business. So that, that's, that, that's the thing. Uh, there will be people or maybe most of them who will want to get news for free. And sometimes they will get crap. And sometimes if you get, if you want to get good quality news, you have to pay for it basically. And, and it's not, those are not huge amounts of money. Yeah, okay, but wait a like, second. Nobody, nobody pays for Teva N, for example. I mean, obviously we watch commercials and advertisements. So the public gets Teva N for, Teva N for free. Are you saying, sorry for the, maybe a tough question, but are you saying that the, people in an editorial position at Teva Wen never consider things like eyeballs and traffic when they're making editorial decisions about what gets covered and how it gets covered? They are, because we are still, overall, we are still in the ad business, like the TV mostly, overall, is the ad business plus cable subscriptions. I believe it's something oh, right. like, yeah, yeah. like 40 to 60, something like that, mostly advertisement. But um, when it comes to, let's say, the business models of the future, I wouldn't say that uh, the ad-supported business models for quality news has a future. I wouldn't say that. I would say that it would be about subscriptions, donations, foundations, and things like that, but for sure not about getting uh, clicks or like page views, because those are not main indicators or factors for quality media who believe in, uh, in, 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 in subscriptions. But the last, the last argument, because during the coronavirus, since the coronavirus started, uh, subscription media uh, saw huge spike in the number of subscribers, while the ad revenue has fallen significantly. Of course, how did that happen? Because there are m much less companies who want to advertise because... But, but more people willing to pay to watch yes. or read. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's, that's the case. Just let me, let me just bring this back to Corona for just a second. Would you agree in general terms that independent of the facts, completely apart from the science, would you agree that the media has enormous power to convince the public that the situation is getting better or worse? They have, absolutely. It's not... Uh, the media shouldn't be about scaring people. Some of them are. Don't scare, don't scare people watch TV and read newspapers more? It depends on what you are looking for. I, I consider myself a, a quite, let's say, sophisticated reader or news consumer. But I think there will be less and less money when it comes to this kind of business models of scaring people. It's about the platforms. Uh, it's their business models. But here's the philosophical, philosophical questions, whether they are journalism saviors or journalism enemies. And it is a fact that print media now is becoming nearly exclusively behind a paywall, as you say. And print media journalism drives the kind of news cycle where you see, uh, you know, you know, nightly news updates. So it is really important that people have access to the original information and fake news is free and good news, like you say, costs money. So it is it is something that as a society, we're not used to a subscription for our news and there's so much free stuff you can get out there anyway there's always the temptation to uh to cheapen it and uh you know go after that that kind of source that wasn't really a question i just wanted to say that <laughs> <laughs> robert I, I should have mentioned at the top of the show that among the many many different subjects that you've covered in your investigative pieces uh, uh um kidnappings uh murders attempted murders i think yeah uh, strip clubs, which is something we've talked about quite a bit here thanks on our show. You. You, were, you were the inspiration. Ah, uh, thanks. Ah, uh, thank you, Robert. Uh, 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 pr recently, you did a piece on uh, on on um, parental abductions of children. So, really, across a broad spectrum, and I think one of the common denominators in a lot of the work that you do is that you very often have to work closely with governmental authorities or use official resources, especially um, in the criminal justice system, right? And that kind of leads into something we wanted to ask you about here on our show uh, in more detail, because I think you have some interesting uh, information about this. It's a, it's a subject that we raised, what, about three weeks ago, mm -hmm. guys, something like that? Big story breaking here in Krakow. It has connections to other cities as well. 
But the appeal court here in Krakow, uh, we learned that uh, prosecutor in Zhezhov has has brought charges against uh, f- like 45 people uh, in connection with uh, basically a, a theft ring, stealing you know millions of very was it 35 million zlotys? I forgot how much it was. Uh, you know, f- invoices for uh, services and products that didn't exist, and just a, you know organized crime essentially. And uh, we uh, we want to ask you what you can tell us about this huge story. There's a lot to, to talk about. <laughs> to talk about. <laughs> Take your time. <laughs> uh, you're right. It was 35 million uh, PLN, the Polish currency, which is roughly something between eight and nine million euros. Depends on the exchange well, rate. Well, almost ten million dollars. I mean, it's, it's a lot of money. Something like that. But the case. Let's get back to the origins. The case started in 2016. At the end of 2016, there were first arrests. It was about this investigation in Zeshuv. And now we have three separate court cases, cases, three separate trials. The first one was a trial of, or is still a trial, of a former president of the court, actually the only judge in this in this pack uh, and it's pretty interesting because uh, this guy was about to when it comes to this case the verdict was about to be delivered a year ago and something unexpected happened because the court um, decided that they want to hear witness statements from the rest of the of the pack but they are officially accused in separate trials. But as and as long as they are accused, they can lie and they can deny deliver, they, they can deny delivering their testimonies because as the accused, they are not obliged to deliver things which might which might impact like they position they incriminate themselves. They have a right to not incriminate yes. themselves and, and, so, and the right to lie, basically, so, if they want so, to. Yeah. So the court, in the case of this president of the court, decided to suspend the trial and basically wait in the till the end of the rest of the pack is 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 being convicted. Which is pretty tricky because it might take years to And also have, assumes that they're gonna be convicted. We we'll see. But uh, yeah, and as you say, it might take you. This is the Polish it, criminal justice system. It takes years. It takes like a really long time to get anything done. It, and unfortunately, it's normal. Yeah, that's the way how things here work. Slowly. But the the president of the court, the only judge in the pack of some fifty plus people, um, has been released from from the arrest where he spent well over half a year probably and now i believe he's still getting paid he's suspended <laughs> he couldn't work and he shouldn't work and, and for him it is some kind of a retirement thing giving paid something like, care. something like that and overall considering circumstances it's pretty Comfortable position. Uh, Robert, let me ask just, I know Dave wants to jump in, just quickly. Why isn't this a bigger story? Why isn't this on television screens and newspapers all over the country? I mean, this is a huge amount of money. This is a, a very trusted uh, uh, institution in society, actually a very politicized institution as well, for reasons maybe we can talk about later. But why isn't this a massive story? Why, is this, why does this feel like a, a minor local story? It used to be a French paid story because, as far as I remember, uh, the general prosecutor, Zbigniew Jobro, was advertising this case in the media as like the big criminal uh, gang in the judiciary. While, in fact, as for now, no verdict has been delivered and. Presumption of innocence, of et course. Cetera, et cetera. And there's only one judge among the. F- the, the 50 plus people. The rest are like bureaucrats, I guess. Yeah, and just to flesh that out a bit, the actual scam, because we didn't really describe what it was, the kind of fake invoices for work done. It wasn't the case, it's your classic graft of, uh, you know, invoicing for services through companies and shell companies that never actually performed any work. Was the kind of essence of it? Would that be fair to say? It was pretty simple and audacious. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I thought. It's easy to prove this stuff. Like, I mean, you know, you, 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 would, yeah. you would expect something more sophisticated yes, from. I really did. Court officials. Very simple. 
But there's the saying in Polish, najciemniej pod latarnią, which means the darkest place is right under the lantern. Yes. So you would expect... Hiding in plain sight, as we say. Yeah, I like it. You, yeah. you, you would expect uh, the court to be the bright light of justice. Mm-hmm. That's the assumption. When we While say... Was it fair to say as well, like it was like the top administrator, each key part of the puzzle to make this uh, work w- was all by, and that's what shocked me about it, that there were so many disparate parts that were willing to work together on this and kind of, uh, you know, like the guy who releases the funds from the, the federal government to pay the courts was in on it. The, and all this the, allegedly, Dave, all this is allegedly, of course. The accountants in the various courts seem to all be in it. It seems to be quite a web of connections. Like, I mean, it is kind of, you know, interesting. Like, you know, that, but you're right to point out that was only one judge. That's scary because it lasted for five years between 2011 and 2016. Some 50 people allegedly involved. And this is what scares me the most. That what about internal audits? What about... Uh, like they have to declare everything right? balances right. because so many people should have known about the scheme and no one reacted but it looks like, like it was kind of a perfect corrup- corruption scheme because the main guy the cap the, the capo di tutti capi according to the prosecution <laughs> the godfather <laughs> according to the prosecution is the 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 director of the court who is not the judge yeah. It's it's an administrative function, kind like kind of kind of a general manager of the court. But according to the prosecution, he corrupted his deputy. He corrupted uh, the judge, the president of the courts. He corrupted some clerks, um, and basically, who is among the accused? It's a pretty impressive lineup, <laughs> uh, because except this president of the of the court except the the general manager there is the chief accountant there are some minor clerks uh there is an official from the justice ministry and there are some like a dozen um directors of lower courts from this region a lot of people yeah. in it everybody had their hand out it seems yeah Yeah, it's a shocking list of job titles, really. Uh, you know, when you run through it and you're like, each of the key people that needed to be there were in on it. And like so, you say, uh, Robert, you know, we're on for four or five years. I mean, a lot of people are involved with processing an invoice and paying an invoice. And you would think that among those people would be some, you know, honest people who are paying attention to things. How did, the, you know, how did they get away with this for so long? It's unbelievable. Can't, can't answer this question, but also on the flip side, of course, we can say there was only, there's only, only one judge there. But on the flip side, The entire situation says also something about the work culture there, that there was this kind of permission inside and so many people should have known about it, what was going on there inside. You mentioned Jobro was kind of making an example out of it. Okay, we have to be honest and say that, you know, it's likely he's using this to promote his own agenda, you know, a larger agenda of reform in the courts is, you know, he's pointing and saying, look, this is how rotten they are. And so you need to trust me when I say that we need to reform the courts. Okay. I get that. But still when, when he's right, he's right. Yeah. And when an institution like this, I mean, this is the appeal court. This is the regional, I think regional appeal court. Yeah. I mean, there's, It's uh, it's high up the ladder, I guess. Is my just point. one step lower than the Supreme Court. Okay, there, are, so there are only one, eleven one step lower than the Supreme Court. There are and only they can get away with this. There are only eleven uh, appeal courts in Poland. All right, so this is where I kind of bring things back to the media, and I'll use the example of American television. I'm not saying that it's perfect by any measure, but we're all familiar with the standard genre of television programs that you know investigative journalism into public corruption. You know, this, this, this whole situation that we're talking about sounds like it's tailor-made for uh, a television expose to show who did what and what. So wh- why aren't journalists all over this or are they waiting for it to progress to a certain point or maybe they are all, already all over it? I mean, what, what's what's I going case, on? I think the case used to be a front page story and Uh, I did the research to refresh things before our meeting today, and I saw many publications still available online about all the schemes. So it's not the case that nobody wanted to talk about it. And I think that uh, the case will will be live or 
it, it, it will be front page news still when the trial starts. Ironically, wouldn't it be more, it would be better, a better news story and, and would be juicier if we knew uh, some specifics about, say, the money was spent on a speedboat and it was hidden by his <laughs> nephew. That's and that's what, makes, but that's what makes stories play yeah. with, the, with the general it comes, public. When it comes to money, according to the media, some 11 million uh, PLN uh, has been secured by the prosecution, yeah. which, is, which is like one third a property of the entire yeah. uh, sum. And that's what I'd like to hear more details on when I was reading the stories. Uh, you know, I'd like to hear some of the juicy kind of, like, how big were these houses? Like, you know, which guy had the biggest uh, swimming pool out of this? Like, you know, I, I do think those those details help uh, sell corruption yeah, some, stories some in a cynical way. Some yeah. modest salary driving, you know, new, new Mercedes <laughs> all the time and stuff like yeah. that. But, you know, every time I turn on Polish TV and I see an American show dubbed, you know, the Polish Lecter, and, you know, the, again, the standard genre, crime and criminals, crime and punishment, prison... You know, the first thing that comes to my mind is, you know, Poland, you've got your own crime and criminals. Why is it always an American show that I see imported into Poland? Why isn't there more of a focus? It seems to me there's there's not that much going on when it comes to Polish channels focusing on Polish crime and criminals. I don't know. Maybe it's just easier to buy, like, for... Yeah. <laughs> it all started with cops. Remember cops? <laughs> I mean, I think the Polish media... Over a lot of this kind of stuff, but I don't know. Maybe just I mean, you know, when 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 a TV network buys content, they 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 buy it in a bundle. So sometimes maybe it's just it's just pretty cheap stuff. I don't know. How programming is programming, I guess. Yeah. Going back to the subject of the courts, uh, we mentioned Jobro. He's got his own agenda. Is it possible? Maybe it's possible that because the subject of the courts is so politicized for many many reasons over the last what, three, four years or so. Is it possible that there are certain parts of the media that don't want to highlight stories like this because it's kind of against their narrative and other parts of the media that want to definitely want to pursue this because it supports their narrative? You know, so a lot of people think, like for example, CODE, we all know what CODE is. What, what does CODE stand for, by the way? Is, there, is that an acronym? Comitet Obrony Democrats. Okay, so they're defending democracy by protecting the courts. So for them, a story like this is very inconvenient. We're defending the courts, but we find out the courts are horribly, horribly corrupt. So it's not un unreasonable to think that maybe they don't want to. Focus I haven't on seen a story anyone like this. from the left defending this, though. No, calling no, calling out which you can defend you know, it. Quiet. You yeah. can defend it, or you can just simply not cover it, which is a kind of you know, defending it in a sense, I guess. But anyway, my, my, my question, Robert, is: Do you think because the courts are so politicized in Poland that this could influence coverage of the case in, in any way? I think it shouldn't be the media dilemma. Um, and I think it was not the case when it comes to the company where I work at. But maybe, I mean, the media are different and there might be some media who are not comfortable with discussing such issues. Um, some a, a few months ago, we saw this story, or hear about this story with Virtual Napolska, the news website. They were getting paid by the justice ministry for positive coverage. And they were avoiding discussing some issues and they were caring a lot about writing, let's say positively, about the justice ministry. That's effective advertising, isn't it? Wow. Some people call it native advertising. <laughs> That's a nice... Uh... Nice use of euphemism. Maybe it just occurred to me also when we're talking about media coverage of crime, maybe it's just a fact that murder or child abduction or things like that, it's, it's just sexier than financial crimes. Corruption right? never plays as well. Financial well, crimes I mean, is just you know, boring, maybe. Is that it? People kind of expect graft deep down, I think. You know? <laughs> what about Panama Papers? Yeah. yeah. Like, well, the best, people, we the, know what Panama Papers are, but I think your average man on the street may be not so interested in Panama Papers. The, I th I don't know, I but but talk the, about a murder. Talk about you know the the the, the attractive woman who disappears and her body shows up you know, some weeks later in the forest. People will watch that. But financial crimes, eh? You can report a murder case in many different ways. You can sanction, san, sanctionalize it, sensationalize it, or you can report it the proper way. So it depends. There are different media reporting different reporting different cases in a different way so it's up to you if a murder happens it's it's a piece of news so 
should we or shouldn't we report it? We should report murder, case, murder cases because these are not common things and I, they, they happen pretty rarely, at least, in po at least in Poland. So why not? But the thing is how you do it. Try to not to centralize it and do it rightly. Let me back up for a second away from the topic of the courts, the local, the local court corruption story. Let's go back to the big picture. I'm curious about something uh, earlier in our conversation. You mentioned uh, the, the, the business model of television stations and whatnot. And I'm curious about how the news division of a big channel like TVN fits into the business model. Because, you know, you have the 24-hour news channel, right? You have the news, the regular TVN. And, you know, news operations are expensive, right? They're very resource-intensive. Does the news really pay for itself? I mean, wouldn't, I'm just theoretically here, wouldn't TVN be better off uh, getting rid of their news and just putting another episode of Who Wants to Be a Millionaire or whatever in that same time slot? Wouldn't they make more money? I don't feel like the right person to answer no offense, this, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> this question. But honestly, I don't, I don't work on the business side. Yeah. Uh, I'm a part of the supervisor program. We do investigative pieces. And I believe we are, we are not hugely... Um, like we're not so much commercial, but we are about building this uh, additional value for which subscribers or advertisers are willing to pay as well. We have this mostly my company is about uh, entertainment. That's fine. And I believe that entertainment in a way pays for good quality journalism which is about employer branding as well, things like that. We got we got awards um, when it comes to journalistic uh, festivals. I think it shouldn't be only about pure money, and especially when it comes to journalism, and especially when it comes to high quality journalism delivering investigations. It has always been subsidized this way or other by advertisers by foundations subscribers whatever reality Invest tv in shows investigative journalism uh people singing will not be commercial but wait, never but it's just interesting because you know it, to be a serious channel in poland anywhere if you're a serious channel you have a news division but at the same time you have let's say five hours of primetime programming that is very valuable real estate so to speak you need to you need to maximize and optimize every half hour segment and I don't know the numbers, but I'm guessing that, you know, substituting a rerun of some, you know, Voice of Poland type show could make more money for the network than half an hour of news, which is weird and a weird commentary on us as, you know, as consumers of media. But it, it could be true. It'd be look a bit weird now if you had TVN News 24 and then you started playing Starsky and Hutch at 8 o'clock, John. I mean, they, these are multiple channel networks. Like, I mean, you know. Yes. But this. why not dedicate all the news to the news channel? <laughs> well, why does, a, why does a prestige studio spunk a load of money against the wall to make an Oscar runner? They do it because, you know, you have, to have, visual, you have to have great art alongside, um, you know, to build a reputation in the studio, yeah. to get the right stable of people, to have a reputation in the market. And there's a similarity, you know, with news organizations. Robert, of course. Pre pretend there was a question in there and just <laughs> run with it. I would say, I would, I would answer it this way. In the US, there's this uh, TV station called CNN. Never and, heard of it. <laughs> and they just, uh, I think they just had their the birthday. 30, they are 30 years old. And uh, they're, they're more than that. Doing, I think it's 40. No, 30. 40, it was 1980. 30? No, it's 40. 40, 40. 40. Yeah. Okay, you're From right. From Atlanta, right? Yeah. They, they just had 40 years. And I think they're doing pretty fine. And 40 years ago, Ted Turner was criticized the same way that there's no money. Nobody's going to watch this. In news, yeah. nobody's going to watch this. Mm -hmm. Everyone... Uh, criticize him. Is there room again? Sorry, David. Just want, it, this is big picture stuff on the Polish market. Do you think is there room when we talk about broadcasters, news broadcast, news broadcasters? Is there room for another brand on the Polish market, another channel, or is it pretty much saturated? Do you think? Because we have TVP. We'll talk about that in a second. Tvn, Polsat. That's the big I three. I would say I don't feel like enough? an expert, but I think it's pretty much saturated. Yeah, I think it's quite a varied market, isn't it? I mean, you know, if I compare it to back home, when, when you're talking about some of these commercial real decisions, I'm always, I keep thinking of ITV versus BBC, where ITV's big problem for years was that lack of credibility. You know, 
spending too much money on imported TV shows. Then nobody wanted to watch the news and their sports coverage, you know, and it was kind of this descending cycle, like, you know, of uh, credibility. So it is important, you know. Before we finish up, Robert, can you just take us through uh, an interesting episode uh, happened what, about two weeks ago, maybe three weeks ago, when uh, Teva One was in the news for some interesting reasons. It involved the uh, U.S. ambassador to Poland. Uh, apparently, uh, your kind of colleagues over at TVP, the state broadcaster, uh, unbelievably, they, uh, they, they kind of pointed the finger at TVN and said, you guys are not real news, which is kind of funny, but a different subject. Uh, and uh, as I said, the U.S. ambassador got involved. So why did she get involved and, and what was her message about uh, the kind of the objectivity of Tevawin? A few weeks ago, uh, TVN got attacked on a regular basis by TVP. And they were saying that we are fake news, that we are unreliable, things like that. So I, I don't want to discuss their methods. No, that's like, you, we'll, 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 do that the was... we'll do the bad mouthing of TVP. <laughs> you stay above it, we'll, we'll get in the dirt. That's okay. Pravda, yeah. Uh, so th then, as you know, as, as many people know, TVN is part of the US discovery. And then um, the US ambassador to Poland, Georgette Mosbacher, stepped forward and she said publicly that. Uh, we are part of Discovery, and Discovery is uh, on the is noted on the New York Stock Exchange, and uh, that as part of Discovery, we believe in freedom of speech and things like that. So it was just just it was just a signal that we have uh, their back behind us, and just just like that. Back it's off, unusual maybe. for that kind of super high level diplomat to get involved in. in, in a I thought it was like that, at, yeah. at, the end, at the end for for Discovery. It is also important business, also here in Poland, and it's a big American company. And I think, like everywhere in the world, ambassadors are kind of supporting their businesses. Mm -hmm. So it was pretty normal for an ambassador to to step forward and say a word for an American company or a company owned by by a U.S. company. I haven't looked at these numbers in a long time, but I seem to remember when it comes to um, overall viewership for the channel as a whole and the, the news departments, uh, the Polish public was pretty evenly split between TVP, Teva One, and Polsat. It was, you know, I, I don't think any one channel had a huge, huge lead over the other two. As far as you know, is that still the case? Is it pretty evenly distributed among the three networks? I'm not familiar with the actual numbers at the moment, but overall I think it's a tricky issue because uh, there were issues with the Nielsen measurement methods. And you can you have to also remember that uh, TVN2024 20, is on cable. Uh, TVN is uh, available for free, just basically uh, on, on air. And... In cable as well, on cable as well, TVP and TVP Info is f is basically for free. So they are more widely available in the rural regions, regions and among the elderly who don't want to pay for cable or who couldn't afford to pay for cable. Cable, but I like that has some influence on the viewership figures, obviously. Yeah. As well, yeah. This 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 issue because I remember. It was over over maybe a year, two years ago. I went to visit an elderly couple close to Dobczyce. It's outside of um, Kraków. And they said that basically in their village, mostly elderly left and mo most of them watch TVP because it's for free. Mm -hmm. That was the issue. I'd say that's a fair enough analysis, uh, you know, of the... Of the Still, it must drive it. somebody at Tevawin crazy, the, you know, the, the effort and the money they put into making great programming, and they hear that they lost just because TVP is free, so, you know, and that's <laughs> what we have, they, so we watch but that. But I think also that from a commercial point of view, the target group is like uh, 60, 49, uh, big cities mostly. I think that that's the case mostly. I think TVP has an older demographic which is less attractive to advertisers. And so you, mm -hmm. even less, though you, less educated as well, you might have fewer viewers, but you probably make more money from advertising than I think that's the point than TVP does. And plus, but of course, God knows how much money the government pours into TVP. A lot. Uh, Two a billions lot. recently. Oh, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Do design the uh, little extra gift present uh, for, for TVP. Interesting. 
I uh, honestly think they're embarrassing themselves with all that stuff, to be honest you got to see the, the lower third so graphics on, on TVP is unbelievable. The, the, the lower graphics have become legendary in Poland. Right? It, it, look, it looks like they're like <laughs> Photoshop. Like they can't be, you know. Pure you, comedy. You, like, you say mean, they can't be that horrible, but they really are that outrageous. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Mike has been quiet over here the whole time. Dr. Mike, any questions for our friend uh, Robert from TVN? No, you've been asking the right questions at the right moment. I really can't comment that much more. But I, I've been laughing and enjoying the show as, a, as an active participant in that. Right. Thanks. Very positive, Mike. Mike. (laughs) Feeling okay. Josh Josh and Dave, last chance for questions for Robert. I think I'll just repeat verbatim what Mike said. In fact, I won't even bother. He was right. I agree. I'd just like to thank Robert for coming in and being our guest again. It was really interesting to chat. Anything you'd like to to mention before we before we leave, Robert? Thank you very much, and thank you for having me. No problem, Uh, Robert. um, I know, obviously, the the production of, of. your investigative stories has been very much affected by the COVID situation. Um, any kind of date in the near future where viewers might be able to see an up- upcoming story or is there, we don't have anything scheduled? I don't want to discuss like emerging investigations, but... But no, nothing scheduled for the moment. Nothing scheduled. That's what I mean. Mm-hmm. But I can scheduled. say one thing because we are working on kind of like experimental project um, a coronavirus documentary aimed at Discovery's global audience, commissioned by Discovery, Ooh. being produced mostly from Warsaw by the Polish team. Hmm. And it was pretty interesting uh, experience because I had the chance to interview a Washington Post journalist over Skype. And I also found a New York City bike courier delivering food during coronavirus and like co- coordinated online um the tv crew day there with 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 the courier and we did some pretty uh like great coverage and it's it's a teamwork so um it would be kind of a global documentary we'll see but you just reminded me let me just sneak in one more question Later before we let you go yeah uh you know obviously your work has been uh kind of postponed and kind of you know basically uh, uh closed for now until COVID is sorted out. Uh, what are TV stations doing in terms of having enough programming in the pipeline? I mean, they're not going to run out of things to show us, are they? But at the same time, how are they kind of creating programming during this time when things can operate normally? Everything has changed. So there are reruns, many of them. Um, and some productions, I believe, have just started. So I think, I think it won't be a problem. My program has been stopped for a uh, Two months probably for two months but i believe we will start producing new pieces pretty soon so are there signs that the world of tv production is kind of coming back to life just as restaurants and you know other things are starting to reopen as well kind of the same thing in tv production yeah, kind sure of because getting i back think to work? That, i think there has been uh, there have been too many variables and the situation like for everyone was unclear but i believe things are getting more clear in the future what's doable what's not doable so we have to stick to the rules social distancing covering our faces and i think we can which we're all doing right now actually right in our studio right Dave? yep <laughs> very convincing robert soha of teva Wen. just go to google type in robert soha teva Wen, and all kinds of interest interesting stuff is going to come up uh videos i mean <laughs> why are you laughing josh rule 34 <laughs> Uh, actually, uh, uh, Robert, aren't your video, aren't the investigations you did on the strip clubs like aren't they all over YouTube and every place else? They are on player dot pl. Player dot pl. And especially when it comes to this particular investigation, yeah. it's available in English with English subtitles. That's right. Just I was just going to mention that. Yeah. Type something, something like Polish strip clubs TVN, and you will get it. Mm-hmm. It's yeah, very well, good. I think yeah. Make make sure you type in Polish strip clubs TVN and not just Polish strip clubs because you'll get very different, <laughs> very different search results if you do that. I think. Robert, thanks very much for coming back to join us, and uh, make sure you come back when you have some uh, interesting details on some new story to share with us. 